reading another puzzling account of Jesus and his disciples, specifically today, James and John, the so-called sons of thunder, the sons of Zebedee. Uh, Just to revisit a part of that scripture again, it says this, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask you. And he said to them, what is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left hand in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, we are. We are able. Huh. So at its core, this sermon is about the best seats in the house. And how at one point, James and John, they just um, threw all caution to the wind and just decided they were going to just, I'm just going to ask for exactly what I want. Lord, we want the best seats and ask. We want you to do for us what we ask you. Just say yes now, and we'll get to that question later. We want the best seats in house. One to his right and one to his left. What an interesting passage. Have you ever got to sit in the best seats in the house? I mean, just right up there, right there where you want to be? A um, number of years ago, on a whim, one Friday evening, Lisa was busy doing some other things. Uh, my daughter, Carol Ann, was home, had one of her friends over to spend the night. And um, I said, okay, girls, that's it. We're going to a concert. So the Newsboys was a Christian rock band, and they were playing at the Oil Palace. I had made no plans ahead of time to do this. We were going to be a little bit late, but we were just sitting around, and so I wanted to do that. If you ever heard the song, God's Not Dead, Shine, Jesus Freak, these are, these are Newsboys songs, maybe not ones we sing in this room, but, but great songs. That's the, um, and so we just went out there, parked a mile away, walked in. I just walked up to the ticket gate. I was like, you got any tickets left? Sure. Bought those, and we made, have you been to the oil palace? You remember how that goes? Anyway, we're, we, are, we are 50 yards absolutely uh, to, let's see, stage left. We are as far over that way as we could possibly be. Our line of vision, we're looking through the cables and the speakers and the standards and all this kind of stuff and we're sitting up in some bleachers. There no, there's no nosebleed section in the oil palace, but uh, we are effectively that and sitting in these bleachers. So we're sitting there for a few moments when someone looking rather official with a name tag comes up to the girls and asks them if they'd like to improve their seats. Well, Carol Ann you know, doesn't really want to talk to any adults unless she absolutely has to, so she just kind of looks at me, and I'm saying, what? And You bet, let's do it. So next thing you know, we're being led by this official looking person and we walk all to the very front seat. I mean, the very front seats. There was no one in the whole oil pile sitting closer to the lead singer than the three of us were. That's a picture I took with my phone. That's Michael Tate, the lead singer. We were right there. He and I smiled at each other all night long. We had a great time, great time. It was was awesome, really was. So... um, Back to the story there. Is it just me or are Jesus' disciples kind of like the Keystone Cops? You know, just never seem to be getting it right. Whatever it is, they find a way to mess it up. Take, take our story for today, for example. Did you note how they got into this? Yeah, so here, here's the verse. Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask you. Anyone buying that? All right, yeah, have you ever been asked that before? Yeah, yeah, no, no. Uh, it wasn't too many years ago with, uh, with our, our, our grandkids. I remember uh, my sweet, sweet little granddaughter uh, started in with me on this line of thinking. Pops, I just want you to say yes, okay? <laughs> Whatever it is, I just want you to say yes. And I, and I, 
okay? And I was like, well, I'm sorry, sweetheart. I'm, I have to know what you're going to ask me before I agree to say yes. I mean, I want us to have fun. I, wanna, I, want, I want this to be great, but I'm not just going to say yes and let you make uh, me do something I don't want to do. And so, uh, well, that wasn't the answer she wanted to hear. And uh, that wasn't the answer James and John wanted to hear either from Jesus. So, you know, as a side note, uh, King Herod made a mess of things when after his stepdaughter made him so proud with her dance. You remember this story in the Bible that he promised her, whatever you want up to half of the kingdom is yours. You remember what she asked for? Yeah, the head of John the Baptist on a platter a head which the king had very much want to save, but had kind of overcommitted in this situation. Well, in our story, in this passage, it is a passage that is drenched with irony. As one commentator put it, he says this, but, but Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. You don't know what you're asking. Some have said that perhaps they did know exactly what they were asking, and they just wanted the security of being near Jesus. Well, that leads to a great promise to all of us, to the church, the capital C church, that we need not always live in fear, that we need not continually seek our own security, that we can trust our Lord, to provide for us, to care for us, to love us, to guide us, all of those things. So to James and John, Jesus asks them this one question directly. Are you able? Or are ye able, for the King James among us, right? Are ye able? We're going to sing those words here in a few minutes. It's a good question. Are you able? It's kind of like saying, who do you think you are? Are you able? It, it pierces. It pierces to the soul, doesn't it? You think you can, but are you really able? Reminds me of those final chapters of the book of Job when God sort of grows tired of listening to Job and his friends uh, pontificate and whine and complain of those things when God says to Job, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? So Jesus is saying, uh, you don't know what you're asking. You don't know what you're, are you able to drink the cup that I drink? But James and John full of confidence, full of themselves, undeterred, say, yes, yes, we are. We are able. So apparently, in the Old Testament, this cup, are you able to drink the cup? This cup could mean, on the one hand, woe and suffering, and it can mean, on the other hand, joy and salvation. And so as Jesus speaks these words, he's thinking of the former, the ominous, and meanwhile, James and John are only hearing the joy and the salvation, the sunshine part of it all. Such an interesting story. I think it cleans up really nicely, though, if, um, if only James and John would have answered the are you able question by saying, no. If they would have said no, then it would have gone much different. So, Lord knows I don't expect you all to remember a sermon I preached a couple of months ago. Like, I don't even remember all the sermons I preached a couple of months ago. But, but there was this one that was rather memorable, and so maybe you might have some memory of it. It was the one where a Jesus essentially referred to a woman as a dog. Remember that one? It was kind of, we had to work our way around to understand that one. Um, so in it, this woman is, is in a similar situation with James and John. She's asking something, 
But whereas James and John come at it from a point where we deserve this, you really ought to give this to us. She comes and says, I have no rights. I don't deserve anything of this, but I will just say that I'm here and I'm asking. You know, had James and John approached Jesus in that way, well, then we could all smile and go home and everything would be fine. But that's not what they said. They said, essentially, put me first. Make me important. I want to sit right there or, or right there, right there close, because you're going to want me right here close by. So leading up to this passage, Jesus had been talking about his passion, meaning his death, how he was going to die in the days ahead, pouring out his soul to them, to these disciples. And how do they respond? With this story from today. It's kind of, kind of like this. It's kind of like um, Jesus is talking about his death. As soon as he stops talking, uh, James and John say, yeah, yeah, sure, Jesus, whatever. Um, listen, can we have the best seats in the house when we get to the kingdom of heaven? No. Hello? And anybody, anybody listening, Jesus must be thinking, must be wondering. Adventures in missing the point. And not only did they miss the point there, but James and John also seemed to have missed the point of what Jesus had been preaching to them and trying to teach them over his years with them about this status reversal. One of the verses in, our, in verse 43 of our reading for this morning says, that whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. That's the status reversal he's talking about. One preacher called this problem our Zebedee DNA, right? James and John are the sons of Zebedee. The DNA is this attitude that they seem to have within them, and I'm afraid we have it too. We have some of that same DNA. Well, why is this story in the Bible? Why, why is it in there? What do we learn from it? Does it make Jesus look good? Not really. It doesn't make Jesus look bad either, other than we might think you, you need some better followers, right? Um. It certainly doesn't make the disciples look good, James and John. And there's no real value in making Jesus key people look bad either. I mean, like, why would you choose uh, such a bunch of slackers, right? So it's this problem. Thus, when Matthew writes of this story in his gospel, he changes the story a little bit and he inserts James and John's mother and lets her do the asking on behalf of of her sons. You know, that made with, I want them to have the seats at your right hand and your left hand. And this, I guess, saves them, James and John, or maybe saves Jesus the embarrassment. So in the story, Jesus doesn't praise them. And he doesn't say, well, well you're human. You know, it's okay. I understand. But he does wrap up this passage by saying to his disciples, the Keystone cops, <laughs> us, that the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So is there any value, is there any value in having the disciples look bad? No, but there is value in having them look relatable. Relatable. I can relate because I like to sit in the best seats in the house. I would love to have preferential treatment if it's available, right? Sure, why not? I'll, I'll take whatever there is to offer. Uh, I like to be made to look important. That sounds good. So I can relate. Can you relate to any of those things? I can, we can relate to those, right? So here's my note to self. Here's what I want us to, to really focus on and to remember. 
This passage in your Bible is to teach us not to clamor for the best seats in the house, but to serve one another. Not to seek the advantage, but really to give it away. To give it away. So here, I'd like for us to turn to a beautiful prayer that is attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, It's going to be up on the screen. I hope you can see it well, and I'd like for us to prayerfully read it together, and then there'll be a big finish if you're up for that too, all right? I hope you can see that. Read with me if you can. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. And where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, we got more? Okay, oh, oh, well. O divine master, grant that I may not seek so much to be consoled as to console to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in a giving, sing it if you know it, that we receive. It is in a pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in a dying that we are born to be turned. I'm sorry we didn't get all those words up on the screen for you. but This prayer speaks of that reversal in Jesus' kingdom that it asks and proclaims. James and John seem to be all, they're all tied up for being all of that when Jesus calls us to be simply this. We are disciples of Christ, a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world. A movement for wholeness in a fragmented world. Or as Henry Nouwen puts it, Only those who face their wounded condition can be available for healing and so enter a new way of living. When we're honest with ourselves about our condition, our sinfulness, our brokenness, then we can begin our journey toward wholeness. Or maybe more poignantly, a better way to say that is when we're not honest with ourselves about our condition. We cannot be made whole. So here's our challenge for today. Let us come to terms with our humanity, our condition, our brokenness, our sin, and live the new life of discipleship. Enter a new way of living. Let's push back against our natural inclinations. Let us heed Jesus' call. Let us push back against our obliviousness to the status reversal that Jesus preaches and talks to us about even as he faces his own death. So giving is, among other things, a nod to this status reversal. Giving is a nod to this status reversal because we are giving away the very thing that gives us status, that gives us power, that gives us influence. And that's one reason why giving is good, oh so good for the soul. For it aligns us with Jesus and Jesus' kingdom priorities. So later this week, you will receive a letter in the mail 
uh, inviting you to next Sunday's Celebration and Commitment Sunday. In that envelope, you'll find a pledge card. You'll find an asking budget of what we're hoping uh, to do with our ministry in 2025. We're going to have one service. It will be in Disciples Hall. We've never done this before. We're going to try. Everybody there, contemporary worship, traditional, all mixed in together. That's next Sunday. We'll have great music from our choir. We'll have more music from, excuse me, from our handbells. We'll have music from our praise team next door. I'm going to preach my little heart out. And at the end of the service, we're going to, uh, we're going to bring forward our, uh, our pledges, our financial commitments for 2025. So again, if you're new to our church, if this is not a familiar process, I'm not asking you to bring all the money next Sunday, just a card that says, here's what uh, me, our household, what I or our household plan to give in the year 2025. And after all of that, then, Lord willing, it'll be a beautiful day like today, and we're going to go to the back 40 and have a church picnic, and we'll have Cain's chicken, and it's going to be just great. So I hope you'll come and be a part of that and join in. So, so one more time, back to our story. Why is it in there? Why is that in the Bible? Is it there to teach us how to act as disciples? Should we be clamoring for the best seats in the house, trying to improve our position always? No. Is it there to ask us that piercing question, are we able? Well, that's a good part of it, I think, yes. Is it there to teach us that as Christ followers, we will drink the cup and be baptized with the same baptism he has given, meaning that we will go through the same trials or similar trials that Jesus himself went through, that we can expect that as his followers? That's definitely a part of it. But for me, the main message to look at are the two chairs. And to say once again, here our note to self, the idea is not to clamor for the best seats in the house, but to serve one another. Not to seek the advantage, but actually to give it away for God's sake. And all God's people said, amen, amen indeed.